highs in the mid 70s and taking a look ahead at your Thursday. Partly sunny this night, then becoming mostly cloudy. All right, right now we're looking at a tundra temperature of. I, I don't know, but it's cold. <laughs> it's cold. <laughs> yeah, it's cold. Up in the Mount Washington Regional Airport, it's 27 degrees. We're looking around 33 Whoa. degrees in the room. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. It's the Mixed Morning Show on Mix 96.7 WLTN. In the studio with us, Mr. Dick Alberini, the man, the myth, the legend, the curator of the Littleton Historical Museum, located at the lower level of the Littleton Opera House. Yes. Yes. A um, couple of things okay. is uh, we officially opened. Oh, yes. And um, so here's some of the, there's policy, though, protocol. Okay. And uh, protocol. when one comes to visit the museum, uh -huh. you one will notice that the door is locked for the Opera House because the building is still locked. So our phone number is there. You get there, you call the phone number, okay. and someone will answer the phone downstairs. And we will come up, take your temperature, and do everything that's necessary, and bring you downstairs for a tour. Oh! Um, and admission is it's it's free, but we live on donations yeah, because you have to remember, or people may not know this, is uh, we're not a town entity, so therefore um, everything uh, the the only way we keep our place running is through donations. Right. So if we do this, you can do you can come and visit okay. and uh, so we're open on Wednesday and Saturday from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Yes. and uh, we also have tours that are done after uh, well whenever <laughs> and, uh, whenever uh, as we as they say in Italian a piacere uh, at your pleasure oh, so okay. you just give a call and and uh, call the museum at 444-6435 you get another number down there, and that's the number you call, and you will end up talking to me. Ooh. So, yes, we are open. Excellent. Isn't I'm so happy good? to hear that. Yeah, it's a good, it's, it's a good thing. It's so, a good thing. when we come back, what are we going to do? Oh, my goodness. About? I had like four different programs scheduled for today. So, <laughs> one thing I decided to do, we're going to talk about the Underground Railroad okay. and the abolitionist movement okay. in Littleton, New Hampshire. Ooh. Yeah. Sounds good. Going to be it's it's really interesting. So we'll talk to you shortly. Listen to exciting and I got Facebook going, and I don't know where we're on Facebook Live. Excellent. Is that holding pretty good? Oh yeah, that's a great idea. I don't know if anyone's out there listening, but uh, what the heck? <laughs> I was gonna. That really is awesome because it's not wicked tight. Right. Just it, it just it just snugs it up just nicely. So if anyone's on Facebook uh, watching this this morning, good morning, Facebook uh, Littleton Historical Society friends. <laughs> and um, so uh, it's kind of an intro, really kind of an interesting show. You know what I really like is with. Um, the uh, word processing program, mm. being able to talk into it. Right. Okay, and uh, that's what I did because I, I've read the article all for the past couple of weeks. Right. And I thought, I think this is what I'm going to do today. Although I have another article, <laughs> another program <laughs> here. Uh, and um, so I just spoke and just type, 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 type. I love it. Then I hit print, and there it is. Oh, looks like there are people out there. Who's out there? There's one, two, three, four people have gotten out. Jackie Thompson. Good morning, Jackie. How are you? We can we can talk like this because there's a, a thing going on, oh, uh, yeah. an ad, so we can we can visit this morning, um, and at least till the ad stops. <laughs> but um, I think what I'm going to do is when I'm done with the program, I'm going to take this home. Yeah. And I'm going to download it onto our YouTube page. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. A lot of good stuff. Um, my wife and son did well over 200 miles. I heard. Walking for Alzheimer's. I heard. And that. raised $2,000. Yes. Which is great. Now they're coming in on they're Friday. They're coming in on Friday. Yeah. Yep. And um, is it almost time? Yep. It's almost time. Okay, um, but anyway, I went for the walk. There was like the family walk on on Sunday. Yeah, you know, four and a half miles is a heck of a it's walk. A lot. Yeah. 
Scott Burgess. Come on, Scotty. There we go. All right, now Tundra temperature is standing at around 27 degrees at the Mount Washington Regional Airport, 34 degrees in the Littleton area. We did have frost this morning. We did, I did. You did? I, I didn't did. have it up on the hill. And maybe because the hill's heated. I, I, yeah, probably. Cause we have a heated hill. That's what you do have a heated hill. Yes. That's all that radiation. It has to be. <laughs> all right, 736 on your Tuesday, Mr. Dick Alberini in the studio, curator of Littleton Historical Museum. Now, you wanted to talk about? The anti-slavery movement gotcha. in Littleton, New Hampshire. Gotcha. Um, now, when I used to teach school, I mm -hmm. always taught about the abolitionist movement. Yeah. And... Um, it's it's just kind of interesting. So I it's really interesting. Yeah. And uh, something I want to let you know is that uh, there is uh, there, there, we used to have a, a wonderful art teacher in town, and and some of you may remember uh, Donna North. Uh, she was also Donna Cloutier. She was married to Paul Cloutier, who mm -hmm. was the French teacher, and and uh, Paul passed away a number of years ago, and she married Steve North, yes. who was the principal of Pro Profile High School. Right. All right, and he passed away um, regretfully, and and uh, so Donna is uh, fully retired, and lives out near the Sea Coast. I, I want to say it's Dover, and um, so she was doing some research, and she found a book, and it is entitled. I have a copy of it here, mm -hmm. "Slavery and the Underground Railroad in New Hampshire" by Michelle Arnosky. Sherburn. Oh, okay. okay. And um, she wrote to me, she said, Hi Dick, just finished reading this book and came across some stuff on Littleton. Thought you might be interested in it. I like your video tours of the museum, Donna North. So this came by way of Donna to Ka our friend, Car my, my friend, Carol Ann Gillis, mm -hmm. who I used to teach uh, English uh, with. Uh, she was an eighth grade English teacher and then went from Carol Ann to my wife, and then from my wife to me, and from me to you. Oh. Okay, yeah, so here, here's that thing. So okay. it's really cool, and Donna is a docent at their historical society. Oh, okay. And uh, one of the reasons I opened our museum is because Donna opened her museum, and um, we're following the same protocols. Okay, so I figured, that they are, yeah. Yep, so I figured it all works out. Also, another thing I, I, you know, I said that we were open on Wednesday and uh, Saturday, right. but if uh, you want to tour the museum on a day that we're not open, uh, just call 444-6439, and uh, my home phone number will come up on the answering machine. You call that. Reason why I make you jump through, make people jump through a couple of hoops, is if I do get a ho phone call at home. Yeah. I am really sure that they want to see the museum. Right. Because they had to make two phone calls. Exactly. Oh, yeah. It's kind of like, so, like a filter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, anyway, uh, so I, I took a, a, a few notes here, and uh, it's just kind of neat. So, the names that, we, that come up in this, um, Edmund and Mary Carlton. And they were movers and shakers in the town of Littleton in the 1830s and 1840s. Uh, Edmund was a lawyer, came from a family of doctors. Uh, there were two other men uh, mentioned in this story. And uh, these men were Nathaniel Allen and Erastus Brown. Okay. Now, there's a name you don't hear of too often nowadays, no. Erastus. I hear a beer uh, named that. Uh, the Erastus beer? Mm -hmm. That's right. It keeps you hopping. <laughs> Sorry, bad pun. I, now, another thing, too, the name Pillsbury yeah. shows up several times uh, in, in this article, and I had no idea other than the Pillsbury Doughboy or Pillsbury's Funeral Home, no relationship. So this morning I did a check, and I said, well, I'm just going to give this a shot. And I typed in Pillsbury anti-slavery into Google. Yeah. Google is a whole world of happy things out there. And I found out the gentleman was Parker Pillsbury, and he was a very, very big anti-slavery advocate in the state of New Hampshire. He was an ordained minister, and um, he published an anti-slavery newspaper publication in the state of New Hampshire called Herald of Freedom. And Mr. Pillsbury, or Reverend Pillsbury, also made several trips to Littleton to help the um, 
the uh, yeah, I blew a brain cramp here, yeah, the Carltons, <laughs> in uh, promoting the anti-slavery or abolitionist idea. Right. All right. Now there was a big anti-slavery abolitionist uh, convention that took place in Littleton in 1841. Now I tried to put on my thinking hat and my my visual VCR thingy and went to Littleton 1841. Or well, what did I see? I didn't see an awful lot. I did not see the Thayer's Hotel okay. because it wasn't here. Not there yet. All right, not here yet. Uh, we did have the Northern Hotel that was built in 1820. Right. So I think if they had this convention, a lot of people came in by horse and buggy. The railroad wasn't here. That was 1852. So this is before the railroad came to Littleton. So people came by horse and buggy. They traveled in, uh, and what they did uh, is, if they if they stayed, they would have to stay with with friends in town, or they stayed at the at the Littleton House. I, I think I said the Northern Hotel. That was around. Yeah. It was the Union House, and later became the uh, the Littleton Hotel, which was located where the Masonic Temple is now, gotcha. just down the street. Yep. So. In 1841, uh, Pillsbury spoke at the convention and was very, very well received. Now here's an interesting piece. 1842, he returned to speak, and he was treated very poorly. Oh no! Just a year later, he was treated very poorly. Um, so I'm just, I'm going to read a few uh, a few pieces out of this uh, out of this book. And uh, because Don had made a, a photocopy, and here we go, it says, In the northern town of Littleton, about an hour south of the Canadian border, a small abolitionist group thrived because of the efforts of Edmund and Mary Carlton, Nathaniel Allen, and Erastus Brown. Uh, they tried to change the local church's stand on slavery. Now, this is something that's important. It says the local church's stand. Right. Now, churches, not as in C-H-U-R-C-H-E-S, in plural. We had one church in town. That There's was one. it. Yeah. And that's something we should keep in mind. I mean, in, in Littleton right now, you can swing a dead cat and hit a church. Uh, <laughs> <That's horrible. laughs> as the old saying goes. And uh, so we had one church, and it was a congregational church, which is down the street on Meeting House Hill. Did you know that hill is called Meeting House Hill, Phil? I did not know that, but I'm still watching you swing a dead the cat. cat. It's horrible. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sorry, that's, that's a very poor analogy. But anyway, uh, it does lead to one's vivid imagination yes. erupting into dead cats. Yes. Uh, so anyway, that is called, folks out there, that, is, that, was, that hill is called Meeting House Hill. Right. And I, I do want to throw at you that the Meeting House Hill was much higher than it is now. Okay. So if you know, if you drive west on Main Street heading toward the um, Congregational Church, yes. you do go up a hill. Yes. Well, it was a hill. It was a hill. Oh, so, so they knocked it down? Oh, I'll tell you. You know where the front doors are? Yeah. That was even with the street. What? That was even with the street. Okay. So measure from the doors right. down to the street level, and that's what they they cut out. So it's like it's like a mini San Francisco. Bingo. Gotcha. All right. Uh, also, opposite the church, there is a stone wall. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if you go up that wall almost to the top of the wall, that was the height of the hill. It's amazing. Yeah, it's quite amazing. When we were taking our walk, I was telling my daughter-in-law Emily about it. We were uh, standing in front of the church, and I was getting my forty-seventh breath, mm -hmm. and. Um, and I and I figured I would probably stall and tell them about Meeting House Hill. Yeah. So anyway, well, and actually, Phil, you see the picture? I, I have a photograph. Oh. Not a photograph, but it's a sketch. And that's how high the hill was, and there's the original church. So you can see where it would be down now, what it would look like right now. Oh, sure. What it is right now. Yeah. That's so it. I wonder if I, I... I have this on Facebook Live. Yeah, and so you should be able to put that on there. If they uh, wanted to go to Facebook Live and check it out, what would they do? They would go to, there we go, yeah. they would go to Littleton Historical Museum on That's Facebook, true. and you can follow this. So check us out on Facebook, uh, listeners. Uh, people are now on uh, Facebook watching this. Yeah. So, uh, 
what they tried to do was to get the church's stand on slavery changed. And it says these abolitionists were considered radicals. Radicals? Yes. Hmm. They were radical, if we're looking at today's standards, yeah. they were radical left. All right, I got you. Okay, so they were the radical lefts, uh, liberals, who uh, were trying to get rid of slavery. Sure. All right. Now, you know, one thing I, I when I watch the news and I follow things and, and I see and I hear about the rights, the left, the middles, the liberals, the, and all this other stuff, I really don't get too bad out of shape because being a history person yeah. and a person who taught history for as long as I did and I do a lot of reading, it doesn't bother me because I, I know people are, you know, get all wrapped around the axle about politics today and stuff. But if you take a look, a liberal or a conservative, sure. it is only liberal or conservative by the time period it is being viewed in. Right. Oh, Think no, about it that. It changes. It changes. Oh, yeah. So like now there, there are people who are against liberals, okay, but yet if we go back to the 1840s, mm -hmm. liberals were against slavery. Right. So, I mean, it depends on the time period one is living. Right, I get it. it so, it to, to view back at, and forth. Sure, changes back and forth. So, it says, they suffered persecution and mistreatment for sharing their beliefs and were silenced. The Littleton Anti-Slavery Society had a small membership, but sponsored anti-slavery lectures in town. Now, my guess is they held the lectures at the Union House. Okay. Now, the Union, not the Union House, the Union Block, the Union Block would be next door to where we are. Right. It The Union Block used to sit where um, the topic of the town building is. Yes. Okay, so um, that burned in the 19... when? Oh, uh, Lord, I can't remember. I think I want to say it was the 1920s. And um, so anyway, it may have even been before that. I, I didn't write it down. So anyway, <laughs> the first was held in 1840. It was Pillsbury's first anti-slavery campaign in the Granite State. The history of Littleton stated, From the time anti-slavery found footing in Littleton beyond any other town in all of the mountain district of the Granite State, the Herald of Freedom, now that was Pillsbury's uh, newspaper, had more subscribers there than Conway, Haverhill or Lancaster. The Littleton Society hosted a huge anti-slavery convention in 1841 with major abolitionist Garrison. Garrison is William Lloyd Garrison. Okay. The big, big, big. Uh, he published a uh, newspaper called The Liberator. And I remember teaching about Garrison and, and The Liberator in my uh, history classes. After the convention, Edmund felt it was time that the local church, church make decisions about abolition. The Littleton Anti-Slavery Society requested a meeting of the church to determine what action the church would take on the subject of slavery. Its members wanted the Congregational Church to sever relationships with any church, allowing slaveholders into its membership. Right. All right. Carlton's resolution and requests were ignored by the minister. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I just think it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, and we had basically one religion in the town of Littleton right. and one church. Also, and that was an there, there was an Alberinism. All right. Pillsbury visited Littleton again in 40, 1842, but was not well received. And he asked the minister if he could use the church to give an anti-slavery lecture, and he was turned down. I can imagine. All right. Now, I had read numerous articles about the Congregational Church uh, over, the, over the decades and over the centuries, and they were just pretty well open to anything. Uh, when the phonograph came to town, okay, this was a cylinder phonograph. Right. The first time it was heard in public in a town of Littleton was at the Congregational Church to a packed house. I mean, this was an Edison phonograph that you cranked up. Right. All right. And it was so well received that the Methodists caught on later, you know, for the about a month later. And then there was a concert at the uh, 
Opera House and there were over 700 people in attendance to the phonograph but now I'm off the road and I'm getting back on the highway <laughs> <clears throat> okay so the two gentlemen that I had mentioned who worked with the uh, Carltons Nathaniel Allen and Erastus Brown okay uh, requested to speak at the Congregational Church and uh, the minister refused adamantly and Edmund Carlton requested that they be allowed to speak and the minister and some prominent church members ordered Allen and Brown to cease and desist when they continued speaking. Now, this was during a church service. They got up and started being rowdy. No, you can't do that. Not oh, yeah, service. they got up and rowdy. Okay. And uh, so when they continued speaking, several church members grabbed them, each falling limp, and they were dragged out of the church. Now, you know, I thinking of current history yeah it's happening again I'm thinking of current history sure so we're going back to the 1840s right okay they were arrested and imprisoned okay charges were disturbing religious worship right okay they were put on trial and guess who was their lawyer Brian Ward uh, <laughs> what <laughs> No, he's much oh. younger than oh, okay. that. Oh, um, <laughs> Brian Ward. <laughs> Edmund Carlton. Oh, okay. He was a lawyer. Okay. It had The trial had a large audience uh, because Brown and Carlton were very well-known uh, citizens in the town. And they were found guilty, and they were sentenced to pay a fine or be imprisoned. They chose jail and went to Haverhill. Now, listen, the, the county jail, it was... I mean, it's kind of like, if, if you look at it, it's like staying at a Hilton now. Now it is, yeah. You know? Um, Not then. They spent 16 days in prison. Conditions were horrible. No beds or pillows. It was filthy and overrun by rats. Wait, they came to my house when I was little? Oh. <laughs> oh, I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, so they chose... You know, so these people were, they chose, uh, I, I guess you would probably take the word martyrdom oh, sure. to, you know, for the cause. That I we will you. suffer the 16 days in prison with, with the rats. Right. right. Now, there is a section here that I, I, I really have to read and, and really have to discuss. It's about uh, Edmund and Mary Carlton in Littleton. So it says, Edmund and Mary Carlton spearheaded the Littleton Anti-Slavery Society and worked for the abolitionist cause, but behind closed doors, they helped fugitive slaves. Their house on the Apthorpe Common area, north of Littleton, was a busy station. Now, uh, if I remember my terminology, uh, because it was called the Underground Railroad, I used to tell my students, because I used to visualize this when I was a kid, it was like a subway. Oh, yeah. All right, well, it wasn't a subway. It did not go underground. It wasn't literally under the ground. No. Underground is was secretive. Gotcha. It was like the underground during World War II. Yeah, you didn't okay? know what was happening. You didn't know, and, and these people did it all clandestinely. Very nicely. All right, very secretively. And you know, the Carlton Carlton's house still stands and wow. it's lived in. Oh, I do I know where that is. Yep, and I and I know the people who live there. So what they did is is the homes that were used or the, the houses that were used were called stations, yep. just like a railroad station, and uh Edmund and Mary were conductors. All right. So originally from Haverhill Edmund moved to Littleton and built a house near the Amanusik River. Okay? Now, if you, any of you know where the Apthorpe Common is, and you know where Carlton Street, you go up Carlton Street, you go past the dam, which is on your right. Right. And at the top of the hill is the Carlton House. Right, you can swing a dead cat. Okay, you can swing a dead cat and hit it. Okay, <laughs> you like that one, Phil, don't you? No, I hate it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Before marrying Edmund in 1836, Mary was a teacher at Concord Academy. Concord Academy. That's Concord, Vermont. Vermont. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. And socialized with abolitionists. No, wait a minute. I'm wrong. I'm coming back. It's Concord, New Hampshire. Okay. Uh, socialized with abolitionists there. 
her passion against slavery intensified. Edmund was a successful lawyer in Concord. He per his persistence regarding abolition cost him his law practice, Ooh. destroyed friendships, and wrecked his reputation. Right. I mean, this man put everything on the line for sure his did. beliefs. Oh, yeah. Okay? Interesting. That's good. The Gazetteer, a gazet I have a hard time, G-A-Z-A-T-T-E-E-R, Gazetteer, yeah, Gazetteer, of Grafton County, New Hampshire, wrote that Edmund's abolitionist belief placed him in an attitude of hostility to the dominant party in his church and largely deprived him of his influence in the community. Still, he kept the course marked out. So this man sacrificed everything sure. for, the freedom, for the freeing of slaves. Okay, he closed his law practice and got into the lumber business. I read in some of the history that Edmund actually opened up was partner with uh, Reddington, really Reddington Street. Yes. Okay, and uh, opened up businesses in Abthorpe, and one of them was a lumber business, a sawmill on the Amunsic River, which was placed where, um, well, it was actually uh, a member. I'm sorry, a business partner in the Scythe factory, which was located where the tennis court is located. I got you. Right Already? Yeah. He was appointed by the state to direct the work of building a road through Franconia Notch. Remember, at this time, we did not have a road through Franconia Notch. It was a path. Gotcha. All right. So to get here, uh, it was by way of Haverhill. All right. Now a popular tourist area. He had a large collection of issues of the Liberator, written by William, or published by William Lloyd Garrison, which years later, the Library of Congress bought from him. Oh. I mean, yeah. History of Littleton, New Hampshire, Volume 1. Many a person came this way from Haverhill in order to uh, more effectually avoid pursuit. Often the frightened runaway was required to remain for days at Mr. Carlton's home. Okay, the Carlton house sits on a small knoll beside the river. There is a steep 12 to 15 foot bank. This is before the dam went in. Okay? There used to be a hidden tunnel that went from the cellar out to the river. Oh. It's all gone because when the dam was built, the tunnel flooded. It was caved in. Right. And they, the runaway slaves used to use the Amanusic River as a path to follow north. Unbelievable. Okay, isn't that incredible? Really all right, and it says it was recorded that the Carltons received fugitive traffic from Haverhill. Another source was regular route from Plymouth through Franconia Notch to Littleton, and uh, so that was that was the route. So I mean, Edmund Carlton and his wife Mary, they are buried in the Glenwood Cemetery, old part near the uh, just before there's that little chapel down there. So just before the chapel on the left hand side, you will see the Carlton graves uh, gravestone. Stop by and visit Sahara Edmund and Mary. Okay. Thank them for all their work. Catch you next week. Come to visit at the museum. Bye bye. Whoa! Nice. How was that? That was very good. Actually. That was very good. Well, listen, I got my my whole Facebook world out there. Excellent. And. Um, Jackie says, I've got to get to docent. Jackie, if you would like to volunteer, um, call me at home, 444-6052. We can talk about it. And um, we're always looking for volunteers. And uh, it's more than just being a docent. Yes, if anyone would like to volunteer to help out, I'm going to move this over here. Or would like to help out at the museum, give me a call at home, 444-6052. I'm heading home now for another cup of coffee. And uh, I could talk to you actually this morning if you have some time. And um, But there's stuff going on all the time down there. Um, research being done. Big thing is actually maintaining the uh, maintaining the uh, exhibits. And that means cleaning. I mean, I vacuum that place. I do a lot of cleaning down there. I bet there. you too. And uh, it's big. It's it's about, you know, we have 4,000 square feet of museum. Well, it's big and things are in the way. And, uh, yeah. It's not like just an open area. So, that's it. I'm uh, going to sign off. Uh, this is going to go on YouTube.
and uh, so people can follow it. So thanks for watching, and uh, catch you next week. And don't forget Sunday morning's music program. And uh, that's it. Bye-bye.